Hi, it's Doug. When I was eight years old, my dad came home from work and presented me with a little packet of these. These are pumpkin seeds, he said. We're going to plant one of these seeds in our garden, you and me. But these weren't just any pumpkin seeds. My dad had grown ordinary pumpkins before. I'd seen them in his garden. Now, if you didn't know this, pumpkins grow on vines like you see here. And like any plant, they need sunlight, and pumpkins need to be watered every day. So when we planted one of the seeds from the packet, we gave it water every day, just like we were supposed to. Soon, we planted it in the garden. But the pumpkin from my dad's packet of seeds grew, and it grew, and it grew, eventually getting this big. This was getting crazy. I'd never seen a pumpkin like this. And I knew something about pumpkins. You see, I grew up in a town called Sycamore, Illinois. And in Sycamore, we're all a little bit crazy about pumpkins. Every year, the town has a pumpkin festival where we decorate and display pumpkins on our courthouse lawn. Our city flag even has a pumpkin on it. Dad, I said, we should take our giant pumpkin up to the courthouse. My dad got a big smile. You read my mind, he said. You see, that was my goal all along. I knew how big this pumpkin would grow. You did, I said. Yep. Remember the seeds I bought, he said. Those weren't just ordinary pumpkin seeds. They were a special variety of pumpkin called giant pumpkins. Whoa. Wait, there are different kinds of pumpkins, I asked my dad. Oh, yeah, he explained. Just like there are different varieties of apples at a grocery store. Now, as it turned out, my dad had heard that there would be a giant pumpkin competition that year at the Sycamore Pumpkin Festival, and he thought we should give it a try. By the time it had finished growing, it was really so big that neither of us could possibly lift it up. I couldn't even fit my arms around it. We had to get some of my dad's friends to come over so that they could all lift it together and carefully load it in the back of a truck. We won that year. It weighed 200 pounds the largest pumpkin in Sycamore for the year 1988. I was so proud. I even have a trophy from it still to this day. How did there come to be such enormous, gigantic pumpkins in the first place? As you might guess by now, if you've learned about selection, it all started with an original, regular-sized pumpkin. Using the process of selection, plant growers, people who grow plants, have over time created new varieties of pumpkins, some of which are bigger and bigger. My giant pumpkin at 200 pounds is not the largest pumpkin ever, not even close. In the time since I grew my giant pumpkin in 1988, these days you can buy seeds for a pumpkin variety that will grow to be 2,000 pounds. That's the same weight as a baby elephant. That means that giant pumpkins are now officially the largest fruit ever. This is the first time anyone has tried to make a fruit so gargantuan. But it's definitely not the first time that plant growers have tried to make fruits bigger in general. Size is actually one of the most common traits that plant growers use selection to try to improve. Like here is one of my favorite examples of people changing plants. This is a painting from about 400 years ago. And can you tell what that is? You might not even recognize it, but these are watermelons. Getting to see the old painting is almost like getting into a time machine and going back in time. It gives you a glimpse at what watermelons used to look like before we use selection to create the watermelons we grow today. Back 400 years ago, there wasn't as much of the watermelon that you could actually eat. Most of it was that white rind part which doesn't taste very good. Watermelons today, you can eat all of the insides. It's so tasty. It's one of my favorite plants to eat. What about other fruits and vegetables? What did these look like before selection? You might not recognize this little fruit. Maybe you think it's a cherry. Nope. This is the original wild version of a fruit you know well. Let's see what it looks like today after we've done selection on it to make it bigger. It's a peach. So the original wild peaches used to be much smaller. Or here's a vegetable you know. I doubt you can recognize it in its original wild form here. 
but let me show you what it looks like today after we've done selection on it to make it bigger. It's corn. Isn't that crazy? Plant growers have created different varieties of almost every fruit and vegetable you'd see in a store. There really isn't a single plant that we grow which is anything like the original natural version of that plant. We've changed all of them through the process of selection. So now just for fun, if you were to become a plant grower and you could use selection to create a giant variety of any plant, which one would you choose to make bigger? Selection doesn't just have to be for plants that we eat. We can use selection to change any plant to be something we want more. Consider plants we enjoy just for their beauty, like cut flowers, the kind you might buy for one of your parents on a special day. These are roses, one of the flowers most admired for their beauty. Now in the wild, the original natural rose looks like this. It's so basic, it's so simple. Can you see what we've changed about the rose? Count the number of petals and you'll see what's so different. The wild natural rose only has five petals. But thanks to the process of selection, roses today look like this. They have dozens of petals. If you pick and count all the petals, there's as many as 45 petals on a modern rose. Now, how did plant growers do that? Well, the process of selection is possible because of two important facts. Take these pumpkins, for example. They all came from the same parent pumpkin. But no two individual babies of a parent have exactly the same traits. The only reason someone was ever able to make a variety of giant pumpkin was because no two pumpkin brothers and sisters are exactly the same. You can see here one of them is different. There's always at least one pumpkin that's slightly bigger than all its sibling pumpkins. And so that's how they were eventually able to make a giant pumpkin variety. And with our rose example, the same fact is true. Wild roses almost always have five petals, but occasionally there's a rose that has fewer than five petals, like a four-petaled rose. And there's sometimes a rose born that has more than five petals, like a six-petaled rose. So we can summarize this fact by saying, no two individuals are exactly alike. There's always small differences. That's the first fact to remember about selection. The second fact is that Babies usually get most of the traits of their parents. In science, we say that they inherit the traits of their parents. So with that slightly bigger pumpkin, if you planted any of its seeds, most of the new pumpkins that grew from its seeds would also be slightly big, just like their parent pumpkin. These new pumpkins inherited their parents' larger size. Or with our rose example. If we go out and look for only those roses that have six petals instead of five, and we make sure to create new rose seeds from just those six-petaled parents, then the babies will tend to have six petals too. And now we can start the process all over again. See, because remember the first fact, no two individual babies are exactly alike. Most of them will have six petals, but now some of them might grow up and have seven petals. So that's where the idea of selection comes in. It's plant growers who carefully watch for little changes in traits, like number of rose petals, and then only select those roses whose traits they want. After years of doing this over and over, rose growers have managed to get roses that had eight petals, and then nine petals, and then 10 petals, and so on, eventually reaching the 45 petaled roses of today that are sold in flower shops. You can really see how using the process of selection, we've managed to change natural wild plants into the new varieties of bigger, better plants that we use for food and beauty. There's really not a single natural plant in our stores. All of them have been changed by the process of selection, where we've made them bigger or tastier or more beautiful. We can use selection to improve any trait that a plant has. So now stop and think for a moment. If selection can be used to improve any trait of a plant, not just its size, what's a trait you might change about your favorite fruit?
Because plant growers can use selection to change any trait of a plant, it means we've created a lot of different varieties of fruits and vegetables. Not only are there the round orange pumpkins that you're probably used to, but plant growers have also created, as you saw, a giant variety of pumpkin. But that's not all. If you ever visit a pumpkin patch, look for some of the strange varieties that have been created too. Like this, white ghost pumpkin, or blue pumpkins, or striped pumpkins, weird warty pumpkins, or even this crazy multicolored pumpkin. In total, plant growers have created over a hundred different varieties of pumpkins. Plant growers can make the varieties of a plant look so different from each other that it's sometimes hard to believe they're still the same basic thing. These are all still pumpkins. All pumpkins started out from the same original wild pumpkin, which is thought to have come from the country of Mexico long ago. When you look more closely at any two pumpkin varieties, even though they might be very different in one or two traits, like color or shape or size, they've kept all their other original traits. So if they came from the same original wild fruit, they'll still have lots of traits in common. For example, when we cut them in half, you can see their insides are still similar. There's a thick outer skin and a hollow center that's filled with lots of seeds. And look at the plants themselves. Whether it's a classic orange pumpkin on the left or a ghost pumpkin, their leaves all still look very much the same. And their flowers do too, as you can see in these side-by-side -side comparisons. So even though they're varieties of pumpkin, you can see all this evidence of the fact that they were long ago made from the same original pumpkin. Now, this might come as a surprise, but if you've ever eaten squash before, well, have a look at squash when we cut it open. Does that look familiar? And here's the leaves of a squash plant. If you don't remember, here's the leaves of a pumpkin plant. Here's the flower of a squash plant. Compare with the flower of a pumpkin plant. That's the surprise for you. Squash isn't really its own thing. By seeing its similarities with pumpkins, I can let you in on a little secret. Squash is just one of the 100 pumpkin varieties. It too was created from that same original wild pumpkin that's thought to have come from Mexico so long ago. So pumpkins and squashes are just two different varieties of the same fruit. Just like how a Red Delicious apple and a Granny Smith apple are both apples. It's just more surprising with squashes and pumpkins, since we call them by such different names. But we could have called squash anything, really, like long pumpkin, or maybe a better name for it would have been nose pumpkin. Whatever you call these, they're both varieties of the same fruit. In fact, everything you see in this picture are all varieties of pumpkins. Isn't that crazy? There's such different colors and shapes, but inside they all look similar. So what do you think? Are there any other plants in our lives which turn out to be varieties of the same thing? You know, two fruits that seem different from each other, but actually came from the same original wild plant? There are a few more surprises. See if you can figure them out in today's activity.